Hi, I'm Chris McCreary and I'm the founder and director of the Northern Ireland Science Festival and you're all very welcome to the digital edition of this year's programme. This year we're delighted to announce a new partnership with National Geographic Society and the NI Science Festival which will see four explorers from across the world talk about their inspiring research and careers to date. Tonight we're delighted to bring Malika Vaz to the festival. Um, she's a researcher, a broadcaster, a wildlife filmmaker and she's going to be in conversation with broadcaster and presenter Greg Foote. We hope you enjoy and if you do please make sure to hit that like button, hit subscribe and follow us for more content. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to our National Geographic Explorer series with Northern Ireland Science Festival. Uh, the NI Science Festival and National Geographic have teamed up for four fantastic conversations with four brilliant explorers who are sharing their uh, really interesting and inspiring adventures, research and stories with me. Uh, this is the third in the series and uh, I'm really enjoying getting to chat one on one with these ace National Geographic explorers. I should introduce myself. My name is Greg Foote. Uh, I'm a science presenter and producer making shows for TV and radio and YouTube and podcasts too. Uh, and last week I got to talk to marine biologist uh, Lucy Hawkes, that was really fun, uh, and natural history photographer Jeff Kirby with his amazing footage and photos. Tomorrow I'm chatting to ocean-focused bioengineer Kakani Katija. Uh, today's explorer though, is someone who brings together lots of different aspects of what National Geographic does. Um, as I mentioned last week, these explorers are funded by a grant from the National Geographic Society. And as well as funding scientists and explorers, they also fund uh, storytellers. And today's guest absolutely deserves that title. In fact, she was awarded funding uh, from the National Geographic Society COVID-19 Emergency Fund for Storytellers. That's a mouthful. Um, which looked to help photographers and journalists and filmmakers to tell the stories of the impact on the pandemic, uh, of the pandemic on their, um, on their own communities. So we'll be chatting much more about that later on. I'm really interested in that. But for now, let me introduce TV presenter and wildlife filmmaker Malika Vaz. Hello, Malika. Hey, Greg. So great to see you. And I'm so excited to be here today and connect with so many science and exploration enthusiasts from across the world. So where am I speaking to you from today? So I'm home in Goa. It's on the west coast of India, and it's this beautiful beachy place. Um, a lot of my work has focused on projects in India. I haven't actually filmed back home, but it's a great place to go to the beach, hang out with my dog. And yeah, it's a pretty cool place. Fantastic. OK, well, we've got so much to talk about. But first, like I did in the events last week, uh, I want to give you the floor for 10, 15 minutes to tell us all about what you do. Uh, and then I'll come back and join you and ask a bunch of questions. So over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Greg, and I'm so excited to tell you more about what I do. But to go back to the very beginnings, I grew up by the ocean. So I spent a lot of time windsurfing and diving and you know, hiking along the coast. And I realized that you know, I came from a part of the world where we have so much marine biodiversity. I mean, it's incredible. We have sharks and turtles and manta rays and lots of lots of different kinds of fish. And I realized that one of the reasons why people didn't know so much about this wildlife and didn't connect with it is because our waters are murky. Like if you go diving in India, you can barely see your dive instructor sometimes in the place where I grew up at least. So um, you really have to dig a bit deeper to understand what we have, the wealth of biodiversity that we have. And as I started spending time at fishing markets actually documenting the illegal wildlife trade, I realized that we have so much wildlife and a lot of it is being decimated every single day. And I found that, you know, telling stories through documentary films on television has the potential for impact because you can literally reach into the minds of millions of people all across the world and show them, you know, a side of their own country or another country that they might not have associated with that because most people think India tigers, they don't think India sharks, right? And I think that's the kind of bridge that we want to make through our documentaries where people associate my country and other countries across the world with not just the amazing wildlife but also the communities who live there. So I've been doing this for about five years now and I'd love to tell you about the main themes of my work as a filmmaker and television presenter. 
So the first one is the human side, because growing up, I watched so many documentaries out there. They always focused on the natural history aspect of it, which is fascinating. And I love it, too. And you love it. And we all love it. But it's so important to kind of, you know, really understand the issues that the communities who live alongside wildlife face, not just the pretty coexistence issues, but also the conflict and also the fact that there are solutions out there that really need to be implemented at a policy level and at a grassroots organization level. The second part is investigating wildlife crime, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But this is taking me across India to China, different parts of Myanmar, and to different other parts of the world, documenting the illegal wildlife trade and the criminal networks that facilitated every single day. And finally, documenting the lesser known. I think we have so much wildlife on our planet. And as we live through this extinction crisis, we're losing so much that we don't even often think about. And for me as a filmmaker, it's really important to kind of put the spotlight on these species that are lesser known and lesser loved all across the world. So here's the trailer to a series that I worked on about two years back, uh, which focuses on different kinds of biodiversity. <laughs> I've traveled all around the globe to places beyond my wildest imagination. But there is something very special about being home. India, where I grew up, is enchanting, untamed, and more diverse than almost anywhere else on Earth. I'm Malai Kavaz, a wildlife explorer. I'm traveling across the country, unraveling the mysteries it holds, hidden wild places, elusive animals, and untold stories. Join me on this adventure as I explore how species survive in the 21st century and meet the people that can't imagine a world without them. So that's one of the television series that I worked on, but more recently I worked on a documentary series with the National Geographic Early Career Grant that focuses on the amazing resilient communities who live alongside Asiatic lions, leopards, and tigers in India. And these men that you see me hanging out, they're buddies of mine now, and they actually go out there and set up camera traps, they monitor dispersing tigers, and they ensure that there's no poaching activity in their villages. So they really are the next generation of wildlife warriors. And I think it's incredible because, you know, when you watch television for the most part, you see the stories of these communities represented in a way that is sensational and often paints them as the enemies of conservation. But with this series, I really wanted to go out there with my team and talk to millions of people all across and kind of just say that, hey, you know, the people who live alongside these big cats are the real protectors of wildlife. And if we have them on board in important positions in conservation as the designers and planners and enforcers of wildlife protection, we really can have a big difference on the ground. So here's a tiny clip from the film, the trailer to Living with Predators. Big cats, the most feared members of the animal kingdom, struggling to find space in modern India. As the city expands rapidly into some of our last remaining wild spaces, humans and big cats are being forced to confront one another. But in some pockets, people are learning to live with big cats. But what is the secret behind this coexistence? To find out, I'm embarking on a journey of a lifetime. This forest is where the natural world meets the historical world. Getting up close with these incredible predators. She's literally five strides away from me right now and meeting the communities and rangers on the front lines. Mobile technology is playing such a big role in the fight against wildlife trafficking. To understand what it's really like to have big cats as neighbors. It's super tense right now. If we keep the tiger's neighbors happy, the tiger is happy. This is the story of coexistence, 
like never seen before. I'm Malaika and I'm looking for the extraordinary relationship that some communities share with big cats in India. And one of the other projects that I've been working on, and I'm kind of just like flipping through just to give you an overview and we can talk about them in more detail later, Greg, is this documentary called Palm New Soy, which is focused on the transnational trade in manta rays. So it basically starts off in, you know, at fishing markets in India, and then it goes all the way to Hong Kong and China, where there's a huge demand for them in the traditional Chinese medicine trade. And I think, you know, when we set out to create this documentary, of course, it was an interesting story and an important story. But given the context of COVID-19 and the fact that it really did originate from the wildlife trade, I think this story has become more relevant than ever before. And for me, as a filmmaker, telling stories of the communities who live alongside this wildlife and figuring out ways through storytelling to actually push for better community management and better community empowerment is really important because if we do want to save these animals for future generations, we have to look after the communities who and fish them or people who live alongside them, um, whether that is big cats or manta rays. And it's these little kids who hopefully in the next couple of years will get an opportunity to see an animal like a manta ray in, in the flesh in person, as opposed to just seeing the dried up contraband that they're holding in their hands. And then um, one of the projects that I worked on at the end of 2020 was focused on bats for Al Jazeera. And the reason why I really wanted to you know, focus on this story was because you know, after 2020, and after the COVID-19 pandemic, people across the world just assume that if there's a bat in your backyard, you're going to contract the virus from there. And that's so untrue because you know, a fraction of the animals actually can do that. And it's so, so, so rare for that to happen. Um, but what we actually need to do and what we need to do you know, emerging from this pandemic is really advocate for the protection of wild habitat. And if we do protect the habitat of animals like bats and other kinds of wildlife species, we can create a world that is more healthy for humans and for wildlife. And I went with another network which is more mainstream and kind of a newsy network because I think that, you know, with science communication and, you know, this world, Greg, I think it's important to kind of get it out into different circles because so often we can get science communication just into these very, very small scale, sometimes elitist circles, but it's really important to kind of expand the reach of it, reach audiences that haven't been reached before. And yeah, here's a little clip from the documentary. I'm pretty sure there are no claustrophobic bat scientists. <laughs> Look at this. <gasps> that was right next to my face. So cool. They're getting quite active right now, aren't they? You know, when I put these earphones on, I can hear these bat vocalizations that sound almost alien. But as soon as I take them off, I can hear the sounds of the communities who live nearby, of the farmers who live alongside bats. I mean, if there's any evidence of the fact that bats and humans can coexist together seamlessly, this soundscape is exactly that. I've never heard something like this before. And finally, this is a picture of me in the wild where I'm happiest. And I think, you know, if I have one piece of advice for young people out there who want to be explorers and filmmakers and storytellers, it is choose something that makes you as excited about Mondays as about Fridays. And honestly, when I woke up today, I was so pumped about the fact that it's a Monday and I get to go out there and film wildlife and tell stories about the natural world. And I think that because, you know, sometimes this job can be very demanding and can be difficult and challenging and you're sometimes in very hostile places like in this picture, but it's important to kind of have that passion for the natural world. And even when you're telling difficult stories, like when I tell stories about illegal wildlife trafficking, I try to remember, you know, why I'm doing this and why I started to begin with. And that helps me to kind of give it my absolute 100% with every single documentary that I make. Malika, that was fascinating. What a, what a huge array of amazing projects you've done and some beautiful footage as well that you shared of, of some lovely kind of moments. There are so many things we could jump off to, uh, you know, the conversations around communities, the conversations around uh, illegal trade, coexistence, future filmmakers. You've given us so much to talk about. Let's rewind the clock. Um, you mentioned that uh, you're a national level windsurfer. 
you're a paddy dive master. I also read you've uh, been an endurance horse uh, rider, a sailor, a kayaker. Um, I, apparently you also pilot Cessnas as well. Um, clearly you're a big adrenaline junkie. What drove you, what drives you to try these things um, and what's left on the list? That's an interesting question because honestly, like when people ask me, what do I do for fun? I do dangerous stuff for fun. Like that's what really gets me excited. And um, recently I've been doing a lot of sport, of course, but there's also the aspect of in investigative wildlife filmmaking and some of the undercover investigations that I've been doing in India and China. And obviously, while I do approach it from a very journalistic perspective, and I'm always, you know, story lost. Um, there is an element of adventure because you are going into dangerous places. You are going into places where, you know, I mean, the natural world is a lot less scary than communities who are traffickers and people who are parts of criminal networks. So for me, that definitely gets my adrenaline rush that I require to, you know, go ahead with the week. But um, one of the things that I really, really want to do is I want to tell stories about the communities who are poachers, but from a more empathetic perspective. Because so far, I feel with my documentary filmmaking, I've kind of, you know, gone in there undercover with like a secret camera. But I feel like, and that's also, you know, one way to get that access to information. But maybe the next frontier for me and for my team at our production house is to kind of embed ourselves with those communities and help people realize that these people who are killing tigers or killing elephants often are operating from the perspective of providing for their families and just putting three meals on the table for their kids, just like you and me and people we know are just trying to look after our families. And I think that once we have that empathy and respect for these communities, um, then we can kind of go from, you know, seeing them as the villains to kind of empowering them and seeing that there are solutions out there. But besides that, I am a dive master and I really want to get into technical diving and diving into some crazy caves. So hopefully in the next year, I'm going to be doing some of that. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yes, I've worked with some technical divers before who dive down to, you know, close to 100 meters. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was phenomenal that their kind of deco time was like, go down, be on the bottom for like 30 minutes and then decompress for like four hours on the way up. Uh, it's yeah. an incredible, <laughs> incredible thing to do. <laughs> That was such a great answer because the reason I wanted to start with the adre adrenaline kind of adventure is that, yes, you've kind of built that into your storytelling journalistic side with, as you say, um, the more kind of investigative documentaries. And I want to hear a little bit more about the Manta Ray story that you kind of touched on and about that trade. Um, just give us an overview of that. And then having experienced that firsthand, you mentioned empathy. Were you able to feel empathy for the people that were doing that to the manta rays? Well, I have to be honest, answering the second question first. Um, when I first started out, you, you see these animals that I've dived with that, you know, are really, really charismatic and sentient and intelligent being killed. And it's difficult in that moment to feel empathy for the other side. I just felt empathy for the animals because that's, you know, I'm a wildlife filmmaker. That's where I come from. Um, but as I spent time with them, I realized that, you know, if they had an option, they wouldn't do it. Um, if they had an option of having a more sustainable income, they wouldn't do it. But the same can't be said for the criminal networks. The fishermen, of course, would do other things. But I think the criminal networks need to be treated with the same kind of, you know, um, urgency and um, also like strength, I guess, as you would with, say, drugs or trafficking humans or other kinds of, you know, arms trafficking, because the illegal wildlife trade is much larger than we imagine. And we need to tackle it from our police enforcement and government level enforcement um, strategies in a much more, I think, high level way. But, you know, coming back to the trade, it basically originated, I mean, people say that it originated as um, a replacement for shark fins because shark populations all across the world were going down and traders needed to find an animal that was abundant and that could be you know exoticized to have a demand in the traditional Chinese industry and when I've been undercover in uh, Guangzhou which is one of the biggest epicenters of the wildlife trade in general I've met with traditional Chinese medicine practitioners and they've said to me we're looking through our, you know, initial scriptures and our old books and, you know, all of this, these documents that we have here. And it doesn't say anywhere that manta rays should be consumed. So sometimes, you know, these things are fictitious. They're made because of the fact that there's a business interest. And I think we need to tackle them with that seriousness as well. But as part of my documentary, I 
investigated and followed the trade pipeline from India to the northeast of India, where you have the border with Myanmar. And we found out for the first time, actually, that a lot of manta ray contraband was being smuggled across in that region. And it was actually facilitating insurgent efforts in the region because you have a lot of insurgency and political conflict in that area. And the, the trafficking of wildlife and, and women and drugs often adds fuel to that and it gives people um, the money to carry out these activities. And then for the final aspect of the film, we went undercover in China to document the trade at the market level and meet with consumers as well. But for me, the biggest takeaway really has been that these animals don't have that much time. They are biologically vulnerable, given the fact that they have you know, very few babies and they reach sexual maturity at a much later age than other animals in the ocean. So um, for them to be you know, killed at the scale that they are being killed at right now, it's not sustainable. And when, when you talk about the community perspective, if we don't stop this trade now, what's going to happen is that in a few years, the communities won't have the manta rays to hunt anyway, and we would have also lost the species. So I think it's a bit of a trade-off where you realize that we need to get them you know, alternative opportunities for employment, but we've also got to protect the mantas. Yeah, I think it's a really important um, point to kind of distill from that, that, that it is all about community management uh, and empowerment. But then at the same time, as you said, there's the policy change required, or not just policy, but the, yeah, how we enact um, justice on the people, the higher level, the criminal networks. It's such a complicated mesh, um, but it's, it's fascinating to be telling those stories. I want to come back a little bit to the community empowerment later. You've been on a lot of adventures as part of your wildlife filmmaking um, that have clearly led to all sorts of emotions, highs and lows and upset and joy. Uh, what has been your most memorable um, filmmaking experience so far and why? Hmm. That's a tough question because I have like literally a hundred different, you know, stories with different animals just pop up in my head. But if I had to choose, um, I would say actually I was filming in the forest of Nagarhole, which is in the south of India, um, just a month back. And we were doing a story on elephants and the elephant trade in terms of tourism because elephants all across the world, um, especially in Asia, are taken away into these tourism places where people ride these elephants, right, for as like a tourist activity. And it's really destructive because these elephants are taken away as calves. So it was a very difficult story, but the first part of the shoot was actually in the forest um, and we were tracking down a herd of wild elephants. And I honestly just wanted to see like one elephant. I knew that it was the wrong time of the year that we were filming as well. So I, I wasn't that optimistic, but I was like, we're gonna try our very best. And then on like, the first day we got nothing, the second day we got nothing, the third day we got nothing. And it was literally the last day of our shoot. We had to leave in an hour. And we had this herd of like four elephants and two like tiny, tiny, tiny calves just come right next to my Jeep, like out of nowhere. And I was right up close with this incredible family. And you could see the dynamics as well, like the matriarch looking after the little ones. One of the little ones was actually injured, but, and she was kind of walking really, really slow. And then the other female in the herd was pushing her along, just pushing her. And I realized then in that moment that they're so similar to us and they're so similar to our family structures. I mean, we love each other. We hold each other to high standards. We encourage each other. And just having that moment with a herd of wild elephants when I least expected it. And just as I was leaving the national park was incredibly special. It was the, it was the perfect end to 2020 for me. <laughs> Gosh, that is that is absolutely incredible. Um, jumping back to the uh, the opportunity for tourists to um, interact with elephants in particular, um, you know, I've travelled to places where uh, it's quite obvious that the outfit who's doing it, you know, it, it, it's not being done in a particularly, um, I was going to say humane, but I meant, I guess, a elephantine uh, kind of way. But but then you do get outfits that say, oh, you know, we look after them, we do this, we do that, but you can still ride them. Um, that's, am I right in saying that you should still stay clear of, of, of any of those sorts of experiences? Sure. I mean, I think that I've also made those mistakes. I have pictures from when I was younger with like a dolphin kissing me when I was in Singapore or like, you know, I've ridden an elephant when I was a teenager. But I think it's really important to kind of do your research when you go on vacation. And if there's one rule that I would say just keep in mind is that if an 
an outfit allows you to get up close with an animal in a way that allows you to touch it or ride it or paint it or do something that you could do to your pet dog, then that's not a wild experience. That is not in the books of wildlife experiences. Um, and rather than choosing to ride an elephant, a pet, a tiger at you know the Thailand centers that are that have gotten pretty popular after um, a lot of investigations with National Geographic in the recent past as well. Um, I think that rather than going to these places, if you choose to go into the wild and see elephants where they belong or tigers just walking to the forest, hunting, doing their thing, just killing it in the forest, I think that's when you can actually feel like you're part of the natural world because we really are. What's interesting is that a lot of the people have those experiences, not only because they want those experiences because they're traveling, but they want to tell those stories that they've had those experiences. So part of this comes from people's want to tell stories. But of course, your whole uh, your whole job, your, your whole life is driven by telling those stories. So how do you kind of skirt that line to make sure that the stories you're telling are always right by the animals, but also right by the communities? Absolutely. I think that, you know, one of the biggest issues with the wildlife tourism industry and with wildlife trafficking is that, you know, social media has made it really cool to have a chimp on your shoulder, an elephant around you, or like some kind of wild animal really up close with you. And even with the traditional Chinese medicine trade, it is about the fact that it's cool to consume wildlife. And I think my work as a storyteller and the work of many other storytellers is cut out for us. We just have to go out there and we have to make authentic, real experiences with wildlife cool. That's what that's what needs to be out there. I mean, the, the average teenager on Instagram needs to kind of see images of someone volunteering at an ethical wildlife center or just going out there and helping communities as a way to do it, as opposed to kind of going in there and um, just riding an elephant. Um, and for me, as a filmmaker, I know that I'm on camera, at, on television. And sometimes when you're a presenter, you do things that, you know, the audience would like, or it's exciting for the audience. You, you have to kind of draw people in as well and make it exciting for them. Um, but I think what I try to do is always be cognizant of the fact that, you know, the wildlife is what matters. That's what I'm doing. So if there's a moment where I have an opportunity to get an amazing, amazing shot, but I would be annoying the animal, I don't do it because... It might be a lost shot, but at the end of the day, the wildlife is not disturbed. And if you think about this, so many of us now, there's so many wildlife filmmakers now, that if we all start pushing it and getting closer and annoying and harassing animals, then we're probably going to have a zero sum effect that's worse rather than better. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I want to jump to how you got into this. But first, if you've just joined us, um, this is one of four conversations that I'm having uh, with National Geographic Explorers as part of NI Science Festival. Uh, I'm Greg Foote. I'm a science presenter and a producer. This uh, is, is the incredible TV presenter and wildlife filmmaker Malika Vaz. Uh, do go look at the National Geographic website discover much more about all of the explorers uh, and it's perhaps worth mentioning as well that they're supported um, by the non-profit side of the National Geographic Society. Back to Malika though, um, tell me what it was like getting into this industry, um, you know getting that first job but then also um, carrying on with his career. Sure, I think that, you know, when I started out, of course, I had so much optimism about the fact that there are so many wildlife filmmakers out there, so it mustn't be so hard to kind of make it. But what I didn't realize was the fact that you really, really have to work incredibly hard and you have to work on stories that you care about. And thankfully, um, I managed to do both of those. But I think one of the biggest challenges in the beginning was the fact that I was younger. So rather than being a woman, I, I feel like being a woman didn't really matter to me. I never, ever feel that bias at work. But I did feel the bias of being, you know, a 20 year old on television where people be like, what's your credibility? Or, you know, um, for the longest time, the BBC and other networks have had presenters like David Attenborough, who's much, much older than me. And growing up, I watched a lot of those television networks and I never saw someone who looked like me represented on television. So it almost feels for other people that, you know, the wild is not ours. People from other countries can kind of come to our country and film the wildlife like the tigers in India in Africa, but we are the stories of And for me, I think we need to have stories of people represented, not just as presenters like me, but also as directors and producers and executive producers. And we need to have people from different parts of the world in leadership positions in natural history all across the world. Because I think that, you know, when you have that diversity, not only do you have, you know, representation, which matters, of course, for like social regions, reasons, but um, you also have a diversity of perspectives 
in the storytelling to maybe uncover aspects of a particular issue that you might not have thought about. And very often what I realized was that, you know, the communities were often not talked about as much, but because I can speak the local language and because my skill set, I guess, is just connecting with people and hanging out and just asking them what it's like to live with my life. Um, that's what I went to the television screen. And I think that so many other presenters in different parts of the world um, are now doing that as well. We're beginning to see more diverse representation on TV and that makes a huge, huge difference. So I'd say that, you know, my final thought about this is that it's a lot easier now than it was 15 or 20 years back. And my responsibility as a young woman who's a wildlife filmmaker is to kind of pave the way and make it even easier for the next generation of people from different parts of the world to go out there and tell their stories. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask you about next generation. Before that, though, you mentioned diversity on screen. You mentioned diversity behind the screen, allowing you to find a more diverse range of stories. But of course, it's also showing the communities themselves and a lot of the projects that you outlined, you know, you, you tell the stories of those communities. Um, tell me a little bit more about the, um, the, the funding you got, the COVID-19 emergency fund, uh, to tell the stories of the impact of the pandemic on your community. What was that process like? So I'm a wildlife filmmaker. For the last five years, I've only pretty much told environmental stories. But when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic struck, I realized that when it comes to anything difficult, whether that's climate change or whether that's a pandemic, it's often the most vulnerable who are affected, whether that's communities living on the front lines of climate change or whether that is people who are migrant refugees and migrant workers. So my film was actually focused not on wildlife, but it was focused on the effect that some of our most vulnerable migrant population had in the country because you know a lot of these people are from other parts of India and then they come to other parts of India so they come like they basically move between state boundaries and they do live paycheck to paycheck so when the pandemic happened it wasn't just the health side of it but it was also the economic deprivation that came out of that because people could no longer get that income in to feed their families um, and I think also our state machinery had issues at times with kind of responding to that appropriately and looking after the needs of the communities at the time that they needed it most. So I actually pivoted from being like an environmental filmmaker to opening up my um, mind and, and opening it up to different possibilities, which included documenting um, stories of communities from a political perspective and a social economic perspective. Um, I made a 45 minute film with the National Geographic Emergency Fund for Journalists grant that focuses on the migrant workers but what was really interesting was the fact that you know with all of my films so far they've been on networks like Nat Geo and Discovery and um, Animal Planet and Al Jazeera which are wildlife centric or you know large-scale international networks but with this film we actually got it out on local television channels to begin with and then I pretty much started making the film like around April um, and then I, it was out in May. So it was like a one month time frame to kind of go with, you know, pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production, and that's the kind of like push you need when you're doing a story that is timely, I guess. Um, the film also went out online and was watched by a lot of people who um, are from India. So for me, just, you know, experimenting with the process of telling a story that can reach out to a wider base of audience that I hadn't actually interacted with before through my environmental documentaries taught me a lot that I think I'm going to take back into wildlife filmmaking as well. Gosh, bravo on doing something with that tight uh, production turnaround. That's amazing. Um, that's a great example of, of, as you said at the start, you know, telling the human stories as well as the natural history stories. I just want to give a nod to the fact that um, beyond wildlife filmmaking, you've also worked to empower survivors of sexual abuse, criminally, you know, labeled tribal communities, underprivileged youth. Um, it's, it's an incredible um, array of stories that you tell. And as you said, always driven by empathy. So I think I have time for two more questions. One is to do with future filmmakers, but the first one is to do with communi that, that community management and that empowerment of the communities. You, it sounds like you think that's key, really, as well as protecting the wildlife. It's, it's, it's the communications with the, the communities that are, that are linked to that wildlife, um, inextricably linked. Tell me more about what your thoughts are um, about what we can do to better community management. I think I'm going to respond to your question, Greg, with an example, which was documented in one of the episodes of Living with Predators, the big cat series that I played the trailer to. 
um, in Ranthambo, which is in the north of India, you have this community of ex-poachers who for the longest time have killed tigers and lots of other different kinds of biodiversity. And it was a really difficult enforcement problem because you really cannot keep a tab on so many people out there killing animals on a weekly and sometimes even daily basis. Um, but, and of course, enforcement was one part of it and the police was a part of the you know, process of kind of clamping down on that uh, wildlife poaching. But what really, really did make the difference was giving the next generation educational opportunities, giving the children of poachers access to school where they can learn math and English and science and arts and just really expand their minds and engage with the world at large. And what's happened over the course of the last couple of years is that so many of those children who are from Ranthambo Tiger Reserve are now adults and they've grown up and they're teenagers and they're out there doing amazing things. And for that generation that was actually uplifted through education and through just, I guess, ex experiential learning as well, um, they have the opportunity to go out there and pursue careers that are meaningful to them, pursue careers that are not unstable because wildlife poaching is intrinsically unstable. One day you kill a tiger, the next day you don't, right? What do you do in that interim period? But now they have this opportunity for stability and for self-improvement. And I think when you look at it from a people perspective, from a first principles perspective of let's look after the communities out there, the wildlife will look after itself. And the good thing that we have going for us is the fact that wildlife is resilient. I mean, you look after the poaching problem and you give you know, a certain amount of space and time to a region like a tiger reserve or a national park, it will bounce back. So I'm honestly super optimistic. And I think the solutions really do lie in putting the communities first. I, I love that talk about the the next generation as well. I'm 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 so uh, it's a big it's a big it's core for me in what I do as well to kind of talk to the next generation and and encourage them to be able to have those conversations uh, and to up their skill set and their their science experience. And um, you mentioned earlier that that beautiful phrase, you know, find something that makes you ex excited about Monday as you are about Friday. Um, for anyone watching here who's inspired by uh, the incredible CV that you now have, the incredible uh, um, portfolio of projects that you've worked on um, and not just hosted you know but worked on all the production and everything else behind the scenes what else would you say then to budding filmmakers any other bits of advice for them especially in a in a covid world absolutely i think that's a good question um, my biggest advice would be maybe just take a piece of paper and write down your strengths as a filmmaker or a budding storyteller and write down your weaknesses and write down which aspects of the production process you think you might be interested in. And know once you've done that, there's space for everyone. When I first got started, I'm really interested in presenting and producing and directing. And that's the majority of what I do on film production. Sometimes I handle a camera, but for the most part, I'm just directing and presenting and producing. But initially, when I first started out, I got the messaging from people around me that, you know, you have to be a cameraman, you have to be a cinematographer to be a wildlife filmmaker. And I think that if you have a passion for filmmaking and you have a passion for telling stories about the natural world, you will find a space for you. So really, like, understand yourself better, because that really helps with kind of giving it your best as a filmmaker. And then collaborate with people. I think so many of the projects that I've done through my production house um, have been successful, or they have been, you know, interesting, at least, because of the fact that we've collaborated with amazing cinematographers and editors who really, really care so much about the fact that they, you know, want to put the best product out there, because the film does come together on the edit timeline as well. So my advice really is find your team and when you're starting out just practice like practice 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 even if it's on your phone and you know this Greg because I've been watching your films for the longest time watching your videos on YouTube um, and I can honestly see like a progression and how comfortable you are in front of the camera and the stories that you tell as well so we know the fact that you know the more you practice the more comfortable you get and the better you can do with you know environmental storytelling so practice write down that list of things that you're good at and find buddies to go hang out and film with that really helps <laughs> Great advice. Great advice. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in one super last question, which is what's next? What, what, I'm sure you've got a list as long as your arm, um, but what's on the horizon for you? So I think 
retrospect for the last couple of years, I've been focusing on a lot of wildlife stories, which are focused on say human wildlife conflict or um, the illegal wildlife trade. But increasingly, I'm more interested in larger environmental issues, some of which are so large, they're scary to think about, like how do you condense that into a film and make that impactful? But I really want to tell stories about how air pollution, for example, affects vulnerable communities or how climate change is felt most by people in some of the most you know, remote and hostile parts of the world. Um, and kind of really put the focus back on some of the bigger issues while having the same community-centered approach that I've really gone with so far. So yeah, I think I want to tell more environmental stories that are large scale. And I want to make sure that wildlife and environmental films are on primetime television. I think that they cannot be relegated to the sidelines. We need to have them everywhere. They need to be in our faces until we really act. Gosh, I can't wait to see uh, your next projects. It's been fascinating speaking to you. Uh, takeaways, wildlife is what matters for you. You know, that kind of that kind of rung really true, but also the community around it and working with that community and sharing that community's stories, uh, making sure there's diversity in the storytelling and the stories uh, that we're telling both in front, behind and the communities. But most importantly, that coexistence that is so important in our planet between us humans, the wildlife, uh, and then also in terms of the production and the people watching the productions as well. There's so much there to um, for me to think of and explore. And thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure chatting to you from, uh, from Goa in India, a beautiful place. Thank you, Malaika, for joining me. Thank you so much, Greg. It's been an absolute pleasure and I can't wait until we have our next chat. <laughs> And uh, I might drop in and say hello as well sometime if I get the opportunity to travel. <laughs> then when you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for uh, for watching um, this this uh, conversation, conversation number three, as part of the National Geographic Explorer series for NI Science Festival. If you'd like to learn some more tips on how to be a better storyteller, then do go look at the National Geographic Storytelling for Impact course. Uh, and if you want to know more about some of the other National Geographic Explorers across the planet, do visit the National Geographic Explorer uh, page on the Society website. I've got the pleasure of speaking to four people in total as part of this series. Uh, and you can watch the next and the final one, sadly, Tuesday, the 23rd of February, 7 p.m., where I'll be chatting to uh, emerging explorer and ocean-focused bioengineer, Kakani Katija. I'll see you then. Bye. Bye.